we watched the Bengals win again. Let's talk takeaways. You are Locked On Bengals, your daily Cincinnati Bengals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, Bengals fans, and welcome to another episode of the Locked On Bengals podcast. I'm your host, Jake Lisko. He's your host, James Rapine. And as we will be many times this season, we are joined by Mike Bengals Sands. We're going to get into some of the takeaways after we all rewatch the game. Unfortunately, no All-22 yet, but the broadcast copy can still teach us some things while we wait for Game Pass to get itself right We're going to start today by talking about Jesse Bates, who told the media that he is pissed for multiple reasons. He used that word, I think, four times in his meeting with the media on Monday. One of those times talking about the decision to go for it on fourth and short from your own 30-yard line, but multiple times to talk about how he was going to play this year after the Bengals were unable to get his contract extension done. James, your takeaways. Man, uh, look, it's not surprising that he's upset and that he's pissed off and he should be right to to be frank because he's worked really hard and he's done done everything asked of him and then some he's gotten better every offseason. And I think it's fair to to expect to get a, a fair deal done. But clearly the Bengals wanted to see more to make him one of the highest paid safeties and he declined comment when asked, do you think you deserve to be the NFL's highest paid safety? And that was probably wise, but I keep coming back to this and I'm going to, unless Jesse Bates is is asking for 25 million per or some crazy number uh, or percentage of guaranteed money in his deal. And there's no reason why we should assume that's the case. Then this deal should have gotten done. And I don't expect it to get done now. I think it's something that's going to go into next March. And for Bates's sake, hopefully he balls out, has a huge year and, uh, if you're the Bengals and he does that, you're probably going to have to pay him more than you would have, say, on Saturday night had you got a deal done in the 11th hour. Yeah, it doesn't sound like he's getting any cheaper. The Bengals always do have that franchise tag option. And every time we talk about Bates and the contract comes up, that's going to be the gist of things. They had an opportunity. And I do think, James, it probably is guaranteed money. But that, at this point, is neither here nor there. We'll find out when we see what happens At this point, probably next year, there are a few exceptions to the Bengals precedent of not getting deals done midseason. And most teams do behave this way. There aren't very many midseason extensions done around the NFL. The Bengals, just one of those teams. There are a few exceptions to that rule in recent history for the Bengals. And we'll see if Jesse Bates becomes another one of them. I would say I'm skeptical at this point. However, he did say that he was going to continue to play pissed and that's not a bad thing for the Bengals this year right I mean a pissed Jesse Bates a motivated Jesse Bates which is it sounds like he is is good for this defense he obviously had two really great downhill big hits on Sunday against the Vikings and the Bengals did a lot of single high stuff maybe not as much as we would have thought we actually saw uh, I think a, a truly multiple defense and We're going to talk a little bit about what the Bengals did on defense. Jesse Bates went from playing single high. He played in the box. We we saw Von Bell play linebacker. We saw 21 Ricardo Allen snaps, and the Bengals had three safeties on the field for many of those, if not all of them. Mike, when you went back and watched the defense for the first time, I think you and I can agree It it was a truly multiple defense in terms of you know there were some four three there were some three four there were some there there were a number of different fronts that were presented you you saw multiple personnel packages one of them even had you know three off ball linebackers on the field if you count von bell as one of them with two high safeties being ricardo allen and and jermaine pratt playing the right edge what were your big takeaways i mean jesse bates didn't really make a big impact on this one but what were your main takeaways about defensive scheme from Lou Anaruma with all these new toys to play with? Yeah, it was a little less one high than I assumed it would be just because I think we were probably top five in the league last year and playing one high coverages. And that could be because of Eli Apple was that we started splitting our safeties, giving a little more help, play a little more cover two type things. Um, the fronts were really multiple. Yeah. Like you said, 
Uh, there's a lot of the bear front, which you're going to use against a wide zone team because it's going to limit your double teams. You could play it from our 3-4 type base. But we even got to a six-man surface, which a uh, 6-1, which is what the Patriots and the Bears used against Sean McVay's uh, wide zone. So you're going to have – it's usually uh, two A-gap players, and then just from there you got – uh, two B-gap players, two C-gap players. You got one linebacker behind them. Obviously, Minnesota likes using Ham, so we brought in uh, Von Bell as basically another linebacker, but thought that was a really interesting wrinkle that we did not see at all last year, even against wide zone teams. Um, yeah, plenty of bear. Uh, Pratt, yeah, he played some edge type of, uh, of role there, not strictly off ball. Uh, did give up a run when he was doing that, but for the most part, I thought he was pretty decent for that being – he used to be a safety, and now he's playing on the line of scrimmage. Um, yeah, not a lot to take it with Bates, just because there's no all twenty-two, and I can. He made some big hits, but I couldn't really see his coverage downfield because he's mostly off-screen. But yeah, I like his big hits. He look. If that's what pissed off means that he's gonna lay some more wood. I'm all for it. For sure, you know, I and that's the thing about him, like just tying it all together is that was the big knock. It wasn't his ability to cover, but dating back to his days at Wake Forest, it was tackling and he did have a big missed tackle, but I think those have been uh, fewer and, and, and far there in between uh, over the past year or so, um, you know, last season and this season. So you, you we'll see with him. Uh, another guy I want to ask you about, uh, Chidobe Awuzie. How's he, uh, how's he? Cause it, when you looked at the PFF numbers, looked pretty good. Uh, my instant takeaway was everything that I saw in training camp and at practice looked pretty good. Did he stand out when you went back and watched? He was somebody that I really thought was a little bit underrated coming in. I thought he might have been the best cornerback on this team back when I first deep dove him during free agency. Uh, he just never had good safety play in Dallas. It was, well, a guy we played, Xavier Woods, who's more of a split safety type guy, but they're forcing him into that Seattle cover three stuff. Uh, Never really got as much help over the top as he's going to get here with Bates. And, yeah, he played really good, I think, especially since he was on Jefferson most of the time. Jefferson didn't have a huge game other than that one really long, maybe should have been a touchdown catch. Um, he really didn't have much of a game. And some of them, Jefferson had separation. They ran a lot of uh, – it seemed like once we got into single high and they knew Cheeto was outside leverage, they would run a crosser. So that's – really difficult to cover if you're starting outside and the guy's just running away from you, but he had the recovery speed to get in there and break it up. Uh, I thought his PFF grade was even kind of low for how he played, to be honest, but PFF doesn't take into account, like you're facing Justin Jefferson, who last year was in his rookie year, a top 10 player in the league uh, at wide receiver. So yeah, I was really impressed. I think uh, when Waynes gets back, that might be a, that might be a pretty good duo of cornerbacks. That would be ideal. It was interesting that, Cheeto shadowed a little bit more than I thought they would. I think when we talked to Luke last week for the crossover episode, I was thinking they were going to play sides. The Bengals have always played sides going back for like 20 years. Very, very rare occasions. Last year, I guess we saw William Jackson at times shadow in some instances, but that to me made sense at the time because William Jackson was like the only corner on the team. Also could talk about Mike Hilton, right? Mike Hilton you know, he, he gave up the touchdown. It was a really good route from Adam Thielen on the fourth and four. He didn't have much help, although Logan Wilson tried to robot out of there and find the crosser. Very, very hard to do for Logan Wilson in that spot. But the Bengals sent him eight times as a blitzer, and he was pretty good in those spots. That was uh, the main thought where people thought, you know, Mike Hilton's a good player, but you're going to want to send him off the edge because he's not. you're not going to get his contract's worth in coverage. You're going to get it from everything else. And Bengals look like they know that too. So they're sending them on these. It was, it's fun that uh, last year we ran all these creepers and stuff, which is a just four man rush zone, pr zone pressure. And you're sending a cornerback or a safety and you're dropping a defensive lineman into coverage. And we dropped Trey Hendrickson into coverage. We brought uh, Mike Hilton off the edge and he just times up snap counts. Like he's a defensive lineman and he got a free rush and he had a couple free rushers on these plays, but I mean, the the offensive line for the Vikings was getting beat so bad that it didn't matter that they got a free rusher through the, the C gap or the B gap. That's a, a great transition. We're going to talk trenches, how the Bengals defensive line played, how the Bengals offensive line played, and we're going to get into their relative success and where some of those weak spots were with Mike coming up next. Before we do that, 
All the teams are back on the field. We're very excited. The Bengals won their first game. They're still three-point dogs in Chicago, which means the market still sees them as a neutral field equal with the Bears. And we all watch Sunday night football, so you'll have your own opinion. But Bet Online has you covered if you would like to place a wager on your Cincinnati Bengals on any player props. Maybe you're heartened by Jamar Chase's strong debut in the NFL. Head over to the betonline.ag right now you're going to get a sign up bonus match of 100% a 100% welcome bonus if you use promo code locked on today go check it out all those real time updated odds and props at betonline.ag they'll have you covered for all your sports betting needs bet online your online sports book experts we've started talking about rivertown inquiry in apparel but if you're new to the podcast I got to tell you about them because they are a local homegrown company dedicating to making shirts and products that you love. And I visited Doug's shop in Hyde Park last week, got to check out all the shirts. They have cool glasses, certainly a lot of Bengals and tiger oriented gear. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my shirt there. And look, you want quality. You want something that's going to hold up. And if you can help a local business, and support a local business while you do it. That's that's it. That's the trifecta, right? So check them out right now. They've been founded, or they were founded rather, in 2013. And you can stand out with a unique shirt at Paul Brown Stadium or wherever you're going to watch the Bengals games. You can shop online if you don't live in Cincinnati or you're not going to make it in person at rivertowninquiry.com, or you can visit the retail shop in the heart of Oakley, it's 10 minutes from Paul Brown Stadium, 3096 Madison Road. Again, I went there last week. It is awesome. They're open Tuesday through Friday, 10 to 6, 10 to 5 on Saturday, 11 to 4 on Sunday. Stop wasting your money on shirts that are going to be dated, dingy, and breakdown. Go to Rivertown Inquiry and Apparel to buy something you'll love wearing. Shop online at rivertowninquiry.com. Promo code locked on 10 and get 10% off your order. Again, locked on 10 at rivertowninquiry.com. I can't wait to get my very own Rivertown Inquiry shirt. I'm very excited, very excited for, for this development. Can't wait to visit the store when I'm in town. I'm going to book my flight for week four today. This is this is a thing that is going to happen in the world. Very excited. Uh, we've got Mike here at Bengal Sands on Twitter. We're doing our rewatch, recap what our takeaways were. I rewatched the offensive line. Last night, I rewatched the entire game, but I focused on the offensive line because I didn't really watch the offensive line that closely during the game. And my takeaways were the tackles were great. PFF agrees, by the way. The tackles played really well. Daniil Hunter got revenge gamed upon by Riley Reef, who got his revenge on the Minnesota Vikings. The interior offensive line, not quite as good as the tackles. Uh, once, As you get in, it gets worse. Is, is the theme. The tackle's really good. You step into the guards a little bit worse. Xavier Suofilo got beat pretty badly a couple times, including on the T. Higgins touchdown. Leads to a Joe Burrow hit. Uh, didn't love to see that. Quentin Spain gets beat pretty badly once, I would say. A lot of people want to blame him for the free rushers. Not his fault. The Nick Vigil sack, that's on Joe Mixon, for example. But uh, the one that Quentin Spain did get beat on, Trey Hopkins was there to clean up, luckily. No no contact on Joe Burrow on that one. But Trey Hopkins had his own issues, getting beat pretty cleanly a couple times by some swim moves from Michael Pierce. But really, I would say the Bengals did a lot to protect Joe Burrow that wasn't just on the offensive line. This was pointed out by, oh man, I can't remember. One of the PFF analysts that I retweeted on Monday, and I feel terrible that I can't remember his name, but he pointed out that the Bengals had a much increased rate of Game script neutral play action, which is going to slow down the pass rush. They had a much higher use or much lower use, I should say, of empty. As we saw this transition to the wide zone scheme, uh, that just puts Joe Burrow under center a lot more on passing concepts as well, just because they want everything to look the same. If you look at how Sean McVay runs his offense, for example. So uh, it seems to me that there were some some processing issues maybe like one of joe burrow's sacks that he took you know maybe he needs to get out of that play the the play where you end up with drew sample one-on-one -on -one with daniel hunter you have a play action that that you run it into a really good harrison smith blitz he's very good 
as a blitzer from the safety position. Samaj P. Ryan doesn't get enough of him. And Joe Mixon on one play, the Nick Vigil sack at the beginning of the game, starts his progression in blocking on the wrong side. Maybe he didn't get the memo. He, he fixed that, Joe Mixon did, in-game. They had the same blitz call that they faced later on the Jamar Chase touchdown. He fixes that, and that's a really promising sign that he is learning, at least in-game, making instant adjustments. But, Sands, as you rewatch the game, Mike, what were your takeaways for the offensive line? Is there anything that you noticed that gave them problems in particular that we should be watching? Is It's a very similar matchup coming up in terms of strengths and weaknesses of the Chicago Bears defensive front. Yeah, on paper, it, really similar. One elite pass rusher, uh, Khalil Mack this time instead of Daniel Hunter. Uh, so we'll see if the tackles keep up their improvement. I'm sure they'll get help. Uh, the one thing about the Bears is that I don't think they will be as proficient at creating free rushers because what Mike Zimmer does, and I think this is what happened on the Joe Mixon play. I mean, I could be wrong, but it looked to me like they found out, they see the protection and then they shift late. And Joe, so Joe Burrow changes his protection. Trey Hopkins changes it. And Joe Mixon just, I don't know if he just missed it or what, but he started on the wrong linebacker. So it was on him, but yeah, I mean, that's just, what a test is uh, the Mike Zimmer defense is that's that's a tough first test for Joe Mixon to be the new bell cow. He's the has to take Geo's role as pass protector. So on paper, yeah, it's just about as difficult. But I do think that there is some optimism that it won't be as hard for Mixon specifically because they won't be disguising and moving late and all that fun Zimmer stuff that he likes to do. Uh, other than that, the offensive line thought for the most part, they played pretty well. I mean, five sacks doesn't tell the story because, as you were saying, one was a tight end sack on Daniel Hunter. That can't happen. You got to just throw that ball away or whatever. Uh, running backs gave up two of them, and then Trey Hopkins off of his ACL. I think this is just theorizing again, but it looked like he wanted to get on Pierce quick, and Pierce used that against him. Like, he tries to come up like a jump set from the center, and Pierce just swats his hands away, and he just keeps going forward, just swims right over him. So I think he's got to clean that up just a little bit, maybe get a little bit of depth after the snap or something. But, uh, yeah, it looks worse than it is because it's a jump set. And when you jump set and you miss, it's going to look worse than a normal set. Yeah, let's stick with Hopkins for a second because I think – that the average fan, most of our listeners in general, they're going to see those two plays from Trey Hopkins and instantly press panic. And then you look at the PFF grades and it, it's certainly going to be low because of that. So outside of those two plays, how did he look in his first game since coming back from an ACL that he suffered in January and he only played three preseason snaps? Yeah. I mean, it wasn't great. It wasn't, I don't think it was as bad as the PFF grade, but also you only get so many solo one-on-one -on -one pass protection snaps as a center. So I think that really brings it down when you lose two, like definitively lose those two snaps and give up sacks with them. So those probably go in as, I don't know what their grades are, but like two, two minus signs. Um, overall, he wasn't dead. He wasn't as detrimental as the grade seemed. I, I think he was definitely a little bit worse than he normally is like, but also he's facing tough competition. I don't know. Mixed bag, and we'll have to see what he does next week. Uh, I'm sure he's going to get stronger as the season goes because, as you said, what, seven months removed, eight, eight months removed, I don't know, from surgery? It's not – it's more recent than Burroughs. For sure. Yeah, I mean, it was way more. It was the uh, week 17 against the Ravens. So, it's uh, – it's, honestly, the fact that he's out there, I was I was surprised when he was fully cleared for camp. And hardly really participated. I mean, as we talked about frequently in the preseason, like yeah. we didn't see very much of him, right? And so really his first extended action, I, I know that some observers noted perhaps some stiffness, but maybe that's just how it looks when you jump set and you miss. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned the jump set specifically. I wonder if this is something that, I mean, we saw, for example, uh, Jackson Carmen do this frequently early in the preseason, especially. I wonder if this is something that's been coached to try to take advantage of something that uh, that um, Frank Pollock thinks he sees in terms of the matchup. 
let's uh let's talk about the strong performance from the defensive line some of the wide receivers in the great game from joe mixon to wrap up the show here with bengal sands coming up next rockauto.com is a must for you if you have an automobile you want to keep it on the road there's nothing worse than having unreliable transportation rockauto.com can help you do that for less you save time you save money with a family-owned company that's been in the business for more than two decades. I've used rockauto.com for something as simple as air filters, whether it's the cabin air filter uh, inside your car, the engine air filter uh, underneath your hood. That's something that costs hundreds of dollars if you have a dealer or a shop do it. Or you could go to rockauto.com, order the specific filter that you need for your vehicle, whether it's a Honda, a Daewoo, a Kia, it doesn't matter. They're going to have it. And you do it. You save time. You save money. It's simple. So check them out right now. And it's not just something as simple as an air filter. It could be uh, you know, a fuel pump or something more substantial. If you're a do-it-yourselfer like that, you can save the time, save the money. So check them out right now at rockauto.com. See all the parts available for your car, truck. Be sure to write locked on in there. How did you hear about us, Buck, so they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need rockauto.com this episode of the locked on bengals podcast is also brought to you by direct tv stream direct tv stream brings live tv and on-demand favorites together like never before which means you can watch your favorite sports movies and shows all in one place no more managing multiple subscriptions direct tv stream brings it all together and the best part is there's no annual contract so stop waiting, get your TV together with DirecTV Stream. You can learn more at directtv.com. That's directtv.com. Compatible device required. Content varies by package. All right, guys, let's wrap up. We haven't gotten to talk yet about the defensive line. Another real positive for this team, especially once you start to look at the defensive interior. All four guys am i right with four guys yeah four guys that played on the defensive interior for this team bj hill uh larry ogan joby dj reader josh tupo besides dj reader these guys played zero snaps for the bengals last year dj reader missed most of the season they were all fantastic given a very good matchup with the vikings interior but they were great i mean the the limiting of dalvin cook the pressure the splash plays, the run stops. In fact, they were so good that PFF put all four of them, I believe, in the top 20 of, of their interior defenders. And Larry Yogan Joby might have somehow graded the worst out of all these guys. I mean, BJ Hill, we, we hardly talked about him yesterday in the recap. He had two tackles for a loss and two sacks. And, and two of the sacks that he had were just clean wins. There was a lot of pressure coming, but they were clean one-on-one -on -one wins. Mike and 24 Lee, snaps too. 24 that's snaps. Crazy. Great point. Great point. Yeah. Very, very productive for a rotational piece. And that's exactly what you're looking for when you trade Billy Price, who didn't play at all for the Giants for BJ Hill. Uh when when we watch this defensive line, where did the wins come from, Mike? I mean, in the preseason we saw a lot of a lot of twists, a lot of stunts. We we did see a lot of blitzes, I think, on Sunday, but when you rewatch this. What were your big takeaways about where the pressure came from? Was it individual wins or was it schemed up? I saw more individual wins, but they were scheming up to get one-on-ones on the interior. So uh, through the bare front, through other things. And don't forget, we got a seventh round pick with, <laughs> with BJ Hill to go with that. So, I mean, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, BJ Hill, I think he beat Ezra Cleveland clean on both those sacks, their left guard. Uh, DJ Reader, he was beating Bradbury and – then Larry Joby was beating, felt like everybody. But I remember there was one, spa, one play specifically, I think it was Larry Joby where he did the Geno Atkins, where he uh, sacked Kirk with his center. So that was fun to watch. I haven't seen that in a while. Um, yeah, they had a dominant, dominant performance to me. Uh, Larry Joby I think, might have had the most splash plays of just his get off when he's on is just so fast. I think there was one play in particular. And I really wish that Game Pass had the end zone tight copy so I could have really appreciated this game because the broadcast is okay, but you don't get the full feel for it. 
uh, looked like he just got off the ball so fast that nobody got a hand on him. And he was in the backfield and Cook got hit for a loss of two. I think he just went down when he saw him coming. Um, yeah, it looked like it was personnel and not scheme for their wins. And yeah, we brought blitzes and the blitzes were working. But like I said, I think at the top was our, these guys were winning so fast and up the middle that Mike Hilton's on a, a free rusher and he timed the snap and he's not the first one there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of crazy. I, uh, I'm thinking about the depth now of this interior line. And if they get pressure like that, obvious every game, that would be ideal. But how sustainable is it? And let's start with DJ Reader. I mean, much like, you know, Burrow and, and Hopkins, he's coming back from injury. You wrote about him in that Washington game, how great he was in the preseason for all Bengals. And it looked like that's it. Like that's him because he did it again this week. Is that is that the expectation, I guess? Is that what you expect from a guy like Reader week to week? Yeah, I would. He's, what, the highest paid nose tackle in the league, and he's put up a dominant performance in this game. He looked – I thought he looked good last year, although not this good. Not this good, uh, yeah. Yeah, he looked good, but not this good. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's uh, he's getting more comfortable on that lower weight, moving a little bit better, a little, a little faster. Uh, his pass rush is be- – I mean, I want to say it's better than it was in Houston, but I haven't watched every Houston game to say that. He looks like – he looks really good to me. Uh, he should have had a sack, but Bradbury gave him a very clear hold as he fell into Kirk as he threw the ball. Um, that got called. Yeah, I would expect it. And over the next few weeks, I mean, he doesn't face a strong interior offensive line. He plays against the Bears interior offensive line, which was terrible last night. He plays against the Pittsburgh offensive line, which was terrible against Buffalo and terrible last year. So then it's the Jaguars and – well, he did well against the Jaguars last year, so he might be yeah, on. We'll a see if we'll we'll see if Urban Meyer is still coaching the Jaguars in Week Four. If he's gonna go for this USC job that just opened up, I, I thought DJ Reader looked great as well. It is noteworthy, I guess, that you know not the strongest competition, probably stronger competition against Washington. But I mean, you don't have to go that far back to find when the Texans played the Colts every year. And he went up against Quentin Nelson. The other thing that I think is noteworthy for Reader is he's playing a lot more pure nose in Cincinnati than he did previously. And in, in this week, yeah, there was a lot of head up on the center, and he was winning those. Drew two holding penalties, as you mentioned, was in on a number of run plays and, and contributed to the Bengals really doing a great job of doing what we talked about as a key to the game, which is slow down Dalvin Cook take away the play action to some degree and take away the big chunk plays for Dalvin. And, and a lot of that is because the defensive line play, played really well. The linebacker, their, their grades on PFF reflect this. They were freed up and the defensive line did its job to make the linebackers look better. Let's shift back over to the offense to finish things up. And I don't know how we haven't talked about this more. I guess we've only had so much time to do it, but Joe Mixon was fantastic. He was PFS top graded running back, which is very much in line with you know what, what we all saw on Sunday. He broke eight tackles. He had a couple plays where he broke multiple tackles on the play. I thought he was more decisive and got north-south faster. I thought he looked really good finding cutback lanes. And the offensive line seemed to, for the most part, pretty well execute this shift toward emphasis on wide zone. And, and PFF had a pretty good split, by the way, of gap versus zone. And I'm curious to get your thoughts there. I think it was like 13 to 11 zone to gap or something like that. I could, that's obviously not as many running attempts as they had. So I'm missing something there, but um, what were your thoughts on Joe Mixon in the wide zone game? Where did it go? Well, where do you think that, you know, there's room for improvement both with the offensive line and Joe Mixon? Whew. Room for improvement. Joe Mixon is just picking up that Nick vigil sack because <laughs> otherwise he was awesome. Um, Wide zone and Frank Pollock's wide zone to be specific, because we ran wide zone last year under Jim Turner and it didn't look this good. Maybe that's the personnel I would lean. It's probably a little more how it's being coached up. Uh, Frank Pollock has an emphasis on the offensive line is going to give the uh, give the read to the running back. It's not there's no guessing involved, you, whether it's going to be the cutback read, it's going to be uh, you have the, the bam, bang, bend is you want to. Well, I think I used two of the bounce, band, bend, whatever, <laughs> outside, inside, or a cutback. And uh, he does a good job of 
getting his guys to give that read and mix. And that doesn't mean that his vision isn't used. It means he gets to utilize it to its full extent because he gets to start setting up these blocks. And also when he's making people like Eric Kendricks miss in the backfield. It's just, it was beautiful to watch, man. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I, I'm wondering if it's a lot of the uh, shotgun stuff is more gap because I didn't get a great look at it. Uh, it looked like we were inserting a little bit, and sometimes we're in that insert ISO. That's a gap play. Uh, we might have ran some duo instead of inside zone, and that is not easy to see on broadcast. <laughs> uh, way easier on the end zone view. So I look forward in the future. There was a few pooling plays. That I chalked them up as pin pools. I didn't think they were power or counter. Uh, especially the one that really sticks out in my mind is when Xavier Suofilo pulled and led and cut blocked a cornerback. And we even ran wine back, which is my favorite play to look for on these wide zone teams where it's kind of like counter without a pooler counter in the wide zone system where it looks like wide zone. Then he's going the other way with uh, Tyler Boyd leading the way for him. So got 10 yards on that play. I'm looking forward for to it in the future uh, for, for improvement, the offensive line, don't let Eric Kendricks get in the backfield. So Joe Mixon doesn't have to make him miss. Uh, pick him up before he gets there. So we'll see next week. Uh, another pretty difficult front on paper. Rokon Smith, a- Akeem Hicks, Khalil Mack. But, I mean, he looked real good against the Vikings. So I think he'll look good next week. Yeah, it seems like. There's a lot more comfort. I think we talked about before we started recording, you noticed just how much more comfortable Joe Mixon is. And and it shows in his decisiveness. And he really played very well and also was good as a receiver. We should point out four catches and was, you know, broke several tackles on one play where it was a dump off to him out of a flat after Joe Burrow evaded a sack. I noted yesterday, there's one play in particular, Joe Burrow changes the play. You see Eric Kendricks shift and shout to his, defensive teammates and then he he gets in the backfield and this is in the fourth quarter and i talked about it yesterday he darts into the backfield joe mixon turns a three-yard loss into a two-yard game and when you're doing that and you're also breaking tackles in the open field things are going pretty well so you definitely take that performance hope it's something to build on you know i would like to see some more shot plays built in late in the game i think i talked about this yesterday when joe mixon on the last drive of regulation breaks off two first down runs in a row and they go, you get two 10 plus yard runs in a row and the Vikings are selling out to stop the run because they know you want to bleed the clock. That's a perfect place for a PA shot play. And so uh, maybe this is something we get in the future. Maybe, maybe not clearly big emphasis on the run game this year. And this is a team playing with a lead too. So we'll see how Zach Taylor does if his team gets some more leads, if he continues to, to call plays in this similar fashion. That's going to be all the time we have for today. Real quick before we get out, one last note. CJ Uzama had a really great little chip block that we mentioned that on, on Twitter today, Mike, you and I went back and forth about on the Jamar Chase touchdown. Uh, they were overloaded to that side, I think. Jonah Williams ended up leaving his guy to go get the guy CJ chipped. But if CJ doesn't chip that guy and get a good chip on him, that touchdown may or may not happen because that might have been a free rusher screaming around Jonah Williams, who was occupied with another guy. So just wanted to give CJ Uzama credit for that before I forget it. Until next time, Bengals fans, we are on to Chicago. Hootay, and have a good one.